I am Crystal Davis. It is a pleasure to, to uh, be here as the moderator. I am the CEO of the Lean Coach Incorporated. And I have the distinct honor of welcoming uh, our first keynote speaker, Dr. Gupal Paul. He actually will bring to us some conversations around managing inventory, a tale of smart adaptability in certain times. Now he's going to actually make the case for a smarter, more adaptable, cutting edge inventory management using digitalization and data centric decision, decisions, merging both demand and supply side predictions. He is a senior business management strategy, innovation and operations leader with over 15 years of professional experience leading high performance teams and delivering innovative state-of-the-art new products, processes, solutions to unstructured complex problems and customers. He's worked with startups. He's worked with geographically and culturally diverse Fortune 50 global companies. And he is going to bring effective organizational leadership, analytical depth, data-driven insight, financial acumen, and strategic solutions to company problems. He's a seasoned leader in developing and implementing strategies and executing channels with C-level executives and top leaders, again, from startups and Fortune 100 global companies. Please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Paul. Thank you very much, Crystal. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody doing? I know I'm standing behind, between you and the cocktail hour pool party. So sorry about that, but I think we're gonna have a lot of fun here. So I wanna talk about inventory. To me, that's fun. I hope that's fun for you too. But anything I have learned today, at the beginning of the day keynote speech that if I don't talk about my company that I'm representing today, Nova Cygnus, then I'm not doing my job. So I'm gonna to explain it to you what you actually do. So um, some of you actually know me, know me as an executive of Fortune 50 global companies like Target or Siemens before, but I also am a founder and managing partner of Nova Cygnus. It's a management consulting firm. And we do provide a lot of cutting edge solutions for operational problems, leadership problems in big companies, small companies as well. Okay, and that's all I'm going to say about it because I want to have a lot more time to talking about inventory, as I said, because it's more fun. So start with that. I'm going to ask you a simple question, right? We all know COVID-19 was a nightmare for supply chain and logistics problem, right? So having said that, how many times do you think within past 10 years, we had big disruption in supply chain. So if you think the number is between zero to five, please raise your hand. All right, you guys are my optimist. I know who you are. <laughs> so how many of you think it's between five to 10? Please raise your hand. Okay, few of you. How many of you think it's more than 10 in last 10 years? There's my pessimist. <laughs> Actually, tonight he is my realist because he is the only one who got it right. So this is from my friends and colleagues at this tiny little consulting firm called Bain and Company. I don't know if you heard about them or not, but I did. So they put together a very nice plot that shows over the past 10 years how many times the global supply chain got disrupted in a big way. And as you see on this nice pretty picture, that the frequency of the disruption has been pretty much more predominant in the recent times. So based on the title of my talk, I think we have fairly surely established that we are living through an uncertain time. Fair? All right. Let's uh, talk about supply chain now, right? Specific, when I think about supply chain, when you think about supply chain, this is what I think. The supply chain in reality is giant mega Goliath helicarrier USS warship. And what you want is to turn it like a speedboat when things doesn't go well. 
Is that a realistic expectation? Eh, maybe, may not be. Let's see what you go from here. So, actual expectation. Question is, why is that? Why supply chain is so massive, inertia-driven thing that we cannot turn it like a speedboat? So, let's ask a very simple question, right? If you are a retailer, and I ask you what your supply chain is, you will say this, that, hey, I get some stuff from my supplier, then I move some boxes over here. Then I move some more boxes over here. Then when I'm done moving all those boxes, then I move some more boxes and give it to the customer. Pretty simple, right? We have some distribution stuff in between, some supplier stuff in between. If you really dig into it, right? It's a complex network. There are nodes, there are multiple touch points. Things go forward, take a little step back. Things go all the way, take a little step back and go all the way back to the supplier if return needs to happen, salvage needs to happen, all sorts of things. So it is a complex thing that just doesn't move in an agile way. So really, one of the reasons I have put this picture in because there's a lot of similarity between this and a social network, right? We all know Facebook, Twitter, or whatever that is called now. So we have users, we have connections, Similarly, in supply chain, we have the same thing. We have nodes, like distribution centers, warehouses. We have connections. You know, the truck and trailer that take move things in between? Very same concept. So fundamentally, ask yourself this question. If social network can leverage big data platforms, like MapReduce, Hadoop, why not can supply chain? Actually, it can. Right? When I talk to these to the lot of executives in the supply chain and the leaders, first they jump out of their seat, they look at me like I have no idea what they're talking about and when the implementations are done, they're like, yep, that's pretty damn good. Let's talk about just in time versus just in case. In a complex supply chain network, things don't move fast, things are very complex, lots of nodes, um, Lots of disruption in between uncertain times, and we are talking about just-in-case versus just-in-time. To me, first of all, I'm a big fan of Mortal Kombat, as you could see. And to me, this is really the epic battle that never ends between Scorpion and Sub-Zero, right? Just-in-time, just-in-case. Come on, guys, this is 2020 plus. Just-in-time and just-in-case are two very, very idealistic models for supply chain or inventory management. Really, just-in-time has this primary thesis behind it that, hey, things are stable, it's a run state operations, things go out, things come in, things go out, and we know anything that is uncertain in between can be quantified, can be planned ahead of time, and can be dealt with in a deterministic fashion, right? That's a lot of big words. Basically, it's a run state operation. It's a steady thing. Well, if it is a steady thing, then uncertainty is an oxymoron. Just in case, guys, on the other hand, is like the group of people who believe that tomorrow there will be a zombie apocalypse. So they're digging holes in their backyard and storing all the cans of beans they can find there. How is that also reasonable? So, point is, as I go through this presentation, you will see that just in time and just in case, it's not one versus another. It's at different places we have to place inventory in a different manner. And it's any of it or all of it together. There is no one formula that fits it all. All right, so we established that some of the practices on the inventory management needs to improve. We established that our, uh, we are living in uncertain times. We also established that supply chain is very complex. So you kind of already know this, so what I'm talking to you about tonight. I want you to live with four very challenging ideas today. Because somebody a decade ago told me, Gopal, you don't, if you don't have a big ask, challenging action item to your audience, you don't have the desire to speak. So I'm gonna leave you with four, very four challenging ideas, right? And you can execute those. And how do I know this? Because I have implemented those in various parts of my life, through my experience in different organizations. So, but they are very challenging still in our supply chain industry. 
So let's hit one more. Step one, the challenging or daring idea I want you to have. Inventory management as a value center. What does it mean? Okay, let's see. Traditionally, supply inventory management is done by all these fancy words we talk about. Inventory turnover, cash to cash cycle, lead time, economic ordering quantity, holding cost, ordering cost. I'm getting tired already. So many big words, right? And if you ever done any kind of course in supply chain management or operations, you have done all this awesome math that might have been horrible for you. It was fun for me. Nobody's perfect. Come on. So, problem with all of these things, as you and I both have done, is that it provides extremely near-term, cost-centric, efficiency, hyper-efficiency-driven analysis of inventory. It doesn't treat inventory as an asset. Inventory is an asset. That's what you sell. That's how you make money. It is not something that you just want to get rid of. For the fun fact, really, if you're a retailer, supply chain within your internal value chain, within your percent of the stuff you do. So if you are not doing 75% very well as a retailer, say, what are you actually doing? So I want you to treat supply chain or inventory management as a value center. This is an asset. You need to treat it as an asset not something that you cut cost on every single time, but rather manage it well so that it gives you differentiating value in every step. Dare number two. I want you to just think about how do you manage inventory capacity spread across all these nodes. So going back to the picture where I said, hey, it has a lot more nodes with connected network in between. You can actually manage inventory across all these nodes at a different capacity, right? So some of those nodes are cross docks, deconsolidations, upstream, mid-mile, return center, receive centers. I can go on and on. You know all of it. And also store as capacity hub for fulfillment, for store pickup, for drive up delivery, all of it, right? So they're basically omni-channel, omni-channel, center or node for your supply chain. Now, ask yourself this question, that if each of these serves a different purpose and you are calculating how much inventory you're gonna hold by simple EOQ, economic ordering quantity equation, does it make any sense? It doesn't because each node has not only just different capacity and efficiency requirement, different cycle time, different efficiency. Simple example, store, right? Or a sortation center. Should you hold any inventory in there whatsoever? No, you should not, because that's where it should be. Box in, box out, faster way possible. If anything holding there, send it back somewhere else. That's not where you hold your inventory. But there is also upstream distribution center, or UDCs, there is mid-mile distribution center. Be very creative, look into your data, understand where you can get far better in capacity management. You'll be surprised how many times you actually drop the ball on that and be super efficient on that. That's where you have far more strategic holding capacity in the network. And that is not just in time always. That depends on what you are holding, how are you holding for, and you cannot use the same economic ordering quantity equation to understand inventory flow through there. The third thing I'm going to have a daring thought on that is, when you talk about inventory, most of the inventory management comes from the fact that we're gonna look into the dis. When you talk about the demand, we say, this much demand I need, this is how I'm gonna order, and somehow the supplier will be able to give you that stuff in right time. Guess what, COVID-19 happened, we learned in a hard way, that is just not true. Because there is inflation, geopolitical stability, global events. There is also specifically like deregulation, tariff, tax cut. Those are macroeconomic policies that drive supply side of your inventory management. They're specifically designed for the supply side. They're not for the demand side for most of the time. So second thing is predict 
the supply side disruption that is coming in your way, not just the demand side. The fourth most daring thing that you will see from my presentation tonight, think differently inventory as an asset. What does it mean? Think like stock, right? You want to buy low, you want to sell high, the difference is your gross profit. If inventory is your asset, how is it any different from some of the financial instrumentation we already use today? Why can't we do options? Why can't we do future commodities contract? Why can't we do inventory hedging, especially if it is a raw material, which is practically a commodity? Why also cannot we do, actually I'm going to strongly suggest you do that, is local global supply network hedging. Think about this way. Your Outsourcing from other low-cost center countries gives you that sweet, sweet margin that you're getting supplier or low-cost item from, but your local network, let's say something that is made in U.S., gives you 18% higher markup on the price, same price, very similar item. So why not use global local supply network to supply both? Create your brand value, get your cost center, but also that's a hedging option when you don't have the supply that you get from the local center. It's a fantastic strategy that has a lot of value already proven to the retailers. So ultimately what you are trying to do here is that some of the stuff you buy, they're either substitutable or they're partially substitutable. It's like complex cereal, right? Two different buyer, supplier A, supplier B. The best part is that supplier A doesn't know what you get from supplier B exactly. Right? It's almost like game theory. There are two prisoners dilemma, supplier prisoner A, prisoner B, and you're playing a bit of a devious game. It's fun, trust me. Uh, point is, you are using this information asymmetry to hedge between the supplier, hedge between the supply side disruptions. So all these things said and done, everybody asks me, Gopal, so when I look at inventory management, what are the things I really need to manage? I say five things, really physical and digital infrastructure. You want to you wanna look into your visibility. Automation on top of it. The fourth thing is your data and SNOP. I think that is the most crucial process on predicting all uncertainties. Data has it in written in everything. The fourth one is supply network, local global hedging. And the fifth one, we actually do a pretty decent job right now, is distribution logistic capacity, do it better, and also bring efficiency. Trust me, if you do this, you're going to have far better customer satisfaction by having the right inventory at the right place at the right time, and you're also going to make your competitors cry a little bit. All right, thank you for listening. Oops, I don't think, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. That was awesome. I could actually ask you a ton of questions about uh, inventory is one of my favorite topics. We don't have a lot of time, so I do want to let the crowd know that uh, you'll be available afterwards uh, for questions. But one question that I have for you is around the, the finance model and the new concepts around, um, around that. What have, have been some ways that you've gotten maybe companies that you've worked with or leaders to be open to um, a different way of looking at inventory? Right. It's really a different way of looking at it. It starts with talent planning and breaking. It starts with one of the biggest challenges I always see is that things are done this way because as we saw in that picture, it's a massive ship that has a huge inertia. So we go that way. That's how we do things. To break that, you need to bring in people that are talented, that understand these processes, but also they have a very different perception from different industries. So building that talent roster, roster is kind of breaks that status quo pretty significantly. So that's the step one. And that's where a lot of companies actually does struggle because there is no fresh air that's coming in with fresh thoughts and ideas. It's almost like you need some people from the stock market to understand hedging to come into the supply chain. <laughs> I would not go that far, but... <laughs> Yeah, no, so really we are uh, out of time, unfortunately, but again, this is a very important topic, one that was uh, definitely triggered a lot of rethinking about how we manage inventory, and I love that your, your title is around adaptive inventory management, so would you join me in giving a, a great round of applause to Kapal? Thank you so much. Yeah.